presence and just worshiping Him with my church family and all our visitors today. It's always good to be here. If you have your Bibles with you, would you open it up to the book of Luke? Luke chapter 5 is where we'll be today. Luke in the chapter 5 in the first uh, 10 verses of the chapter. Uh, so Luke chapter 5. Now, uh, if you're here this morning and, and you know anything about Michael Hendrick, you probably know that Michael loves two things a whole lot. There's two things in life that Michael Hendrick really loves. The first one is bluegrass. You might have even heard him on May 1150 on Saturday mornings uh, playing a little bluegrass in the Bluegrass Saturday morning show on the radio. He does that occasionally. The second thing Michael really, really loves is fishing. Judy's in there somewhere. I'm not sure what order those are in, but his wife's in there somewhere. But <laughs> Don't get you in trouble. But you know, Mike, Michael loves fishing, and if you print him on Facebook, you see fishing photos, you know when he's had a good catch, because he's going to put it on there for you to see. Well, I heard recently that Michael had gone, gone fishing, and he went fishing without his fishing license, believe it or not. And on this particular day, he hadn't got his license yet, on this particular day, he had caught... caught 15 biggest fish you can imagine from Cherokee Lake. He had them in a big old five-gallon bucket. And he was carrying it up the road. And, well, what are Ricky Martin's friends from TWRA had to be walking down the same road? He said, Brother, can I see your fishing license? And Mike said, What, what for? And he said, Well, you've been fishing. I need to see your license. And Mike said, No, you got me wrong. I haven't been fishing. These are my pet fish. He said, You see, every morning I bring them over here to the lake. I throw them in the water out of my bucket and let them swim around for a while. And after a while, I whistle, and they come and jump right back in the bucket, and I take them home. And the, the officer said, now, come on, do you expect me to believe that? And Michael said, you want me to show you? He said, yeah, I'd kind of like to see that. So the two of them walked down, back down to Cherokee Lake. Michael took his bucket and threw those fish back into the lake. They swam around a little while, and the officer looked at Michael and said, well, he said, well, well what? He said, well, how about calling those fish up to your bucket? Michael said, what fish? <laughs> If you want more fish stories, go fish with Mike. I'm sure he's got plenty, plenty of them to tell you. But today, let's go fishing with somebody else. Why don't we go fishing with Jesus this morning, all right? After all, he's called us to go fishing with him. He's called us to be fishers of men. It's the great commission we find in the Word of God. So I ask you this morning, have you been fishing for men? Have you been a fisher of men? Have you been sharing the gospel of Jesus with anyone? Have you done what the choir sing about? Have you told somebody about Jesus? Do this for me. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you know that you're supposed to be talking to others about Jesus, would you raise your hand for me? If you know that you're supposed to be doing that, all right, you can put your hands down. Since we know that, I'm going to share a verse with you. James 4, 17, which says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do, and doesn't do it, do it, to them it is a sin. Oh. Oh. So if we know we're supposed to be sharing Jesus with people and we're not doing it, what does God's word say we're doing? We're sinning. We're sinning. So we have to understand that it's, there's sins of commission, there's sins that we do, and there's sins of omission, things that we don't do that we know we're supposed to be doing. And if we're not sharing Jesus, we're not fulfilling God's commands on our life. If we know what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it, it's a sin according to God's word. And I'm afraid that most Christians are not serious about the Great Commission. I heard a statistic uh, at the Gideon's uh, banquet this week that somewhere around 60% of Hamlin County is unchurched. 60% of Hamlin County is unchurched. So that means about at least 60% of those in your neighborhood, those living around our church here, do not attend church anywhere. I often ask people in general conversation, well, where do you go to church at? Where do you go to church at? And they say something like this, well, nowhere in particular, but we like to just visit around and go to different churches. That happened to me at school this week. I had a parent meeting and I had a general conversation asked them, where do you guys go to church at? And they just gave that exact answer. Well, we don't go anywhere every Sunday. Sometimes we go to this church. Sometimes we go to that church. These are people in our community without a church family, like the great church family that you and I have. They have no commitment to any church, no church membership, no accountability to a church. So most of the time, they just don't go. But if you were to ask them, they would tell you, yes, I'm a Christian. And they might be. 
But being a Christian comes with some responsibility. Being a member of the body of Christ comes with some responsibilities. For one, Christians should be joined to a local body of believers to grow in their faith and to help serve the Lord, help serve the Lord in that church. While we're on that topic, let me give you two quotes from my small group study last week. You may not like these. They might make you mad, but that's okay. The first one is this. If you are not serving in some capacity in your church, you are not a legitimate church member. Pretty blank. Pretty, pretty blunt, isn't it? In other words, if you just come to church and you sit and you leave, you're not truly fulfilling your responsibilities as a church member, as a part of the body of Christ. The second one, an inactive church member is an oxymoron. What does that mean? Well, it means you can't truly be a member of a church unless you are active within that body of believers. Let me say something. This may surprise you, but I would much rather be the pastor of 50 people who are willing to work for the Lord than to be the pastor of 500 who could care less. I'll repeat that. I'd much rather be the pastor of 50 people who are willing to work for the Lord than the pastor of 500 who could care less. I want us to be doing as a church what it is that we are to be doing. Being a light. Being a witness for the Lord. Sharing the love of Christ with the world. Giving hope to the hopeless. Being a group of believers joined together with a purpose of reaching the world for Jesus Christ. I want to brag on some people this morning for just a second who I believe are doing some great works for the Lord in our church. Some great people who are reaching out on for, at first. Our Food on Foot ministry, the, the WMU, they've started that up. They're working hand in hand with the Food on Foot ministry here in Morristown. And each week they are providing bags and bags of food. And that, those bags of food are being delivered uh, to Union Heights Elementary School across the highway. And the needy children there who would not have a meal during the weekend if, that, if not for the food they received from our church. But let me tell you something. That ministry is running out of funds already. And that ministry is running out of supplies already. That's why we had our benefit breakfast this morning. And so maybe you can't go and deliver food. But when you go grocery shopping, I bet you could buy a bag of non-perishable items and bring it to church on Sunday, couldn't you? Or I bet you could pull $20 out of your wallet and give it to, to, to uh, Maxine or one of the ladies at WMU and let them go buy it for you. We got to do that. But thank you, WMU, for your ministry to needy children at Union Heights. You're being the light, showing the love of Jesus. But Todd, Todd ran the bus this morning. We've got a few people here this morning who are here because the bus picked them up today. That's time. That's time consuming. But Todd is willing to go and do that and run that bus on Sunday mornings so that people can come to church who couldn't come otherwise. So thank you, Todd. Uh, yesterday, we've already mentioned those who reached out and supported the police ministry at the concession stand there at UT. Thank you guys for being a light for the world. Somebody was telling me about <coughs> Henry Rush, though. Henry's 94 years old, sitting up here in the front. 94. <clears throat> He's a World War II veteran, for those of you who don't know him. He went to the flea market yesterday. And at the flea market, Henry went from booth to booth to booth to booth. But he wasn't buying anything. He was selling something. Actually, he was giving it away. He went to every booth and he said, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And everybody said yes until the last booth he got to. And the person at the last booth said no. And guess what Henry did yesterday? He led him to the Lord. Amen. Let me tell you something. If a 94-year-old man can do it, can't you? Yeah? Yeah? We can do it. Shame on us for not doing more. People are reaching out. There are people who are doing things, being great stewards of what God has blessed us here in our church. If you've seen Facebook posts, you, you've seen a lot of people doing just taking it upon themselves to do projects around the church. We have all light bulbs burning because some guys decided they got tired of flickering lights and, and light bulbs burned out. They just came one day and put the light bulbs in. Our church sign, we weeded we, and they would kind of the rocks and the, and the stones around it had fallen over. Somebody came and did that and just this week. We had our front steps of the church pressure washed by somebody who gave up their time on Labor Day and came and did that. So there are people who are serving within the church. Thank you for being alive for Jesus Christ and doing that. There's people who are serving within other capacities. Uh, those who went and visited our small group, we went and visited our shut-ins a couple weeks ago. That was a blessing too. 
So there's lots of work being done within the church. And, and, and as we said, we all as church members have responsibilities to be doing things for the Lord within our church. Our job as a Christian is not to come sit here pretty music and, and, and the message and then go home. Our job is to do something for the Lord ourselves. Now we get fed in a worship service like this. We get renewed and revived. And then we've got to take what we've got inside of us and go share it with somebody else. That's the way God designed it. That's the way church works. God wants Bethel to be a church that is truly fishers of men. Amen? Oh, that was weak, folks. Does God want us to be a church that is fishers of men? Amen? Amen. All right. If you believe that, then let's look at today's scripture. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. And then he got into the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to pull out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and we've not caught anything. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down on Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning you would remind us, you'd engrave into our hearts your calling on our life to be fishers of men, that we'd be more than pew warmers, that we would be fishermen for you and fisherwomen for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. First thing I want us to look at this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture is Jesus brings the Word of God to the multitudes. Jesus brings the word of God to the multitude. There were multitudes pressed about in verse 1 said to hear Jesus preaching and teaching. When we think about that, I want, you to, I want us to think about this. Who is our target as a church? Who is our target as Christians? If you were in business and you were creating an ad for, an ad for whatever it was you were selling, you would target a specific group of people. If you were selling Toys, for example, you might want to put your com commercials on during cartoons, right? So the kids can see them and say, Mom, Daddy, help them out. If you're selling sports cars, well, you might have put your ad on there in the UT football game or some other football game last night. So the men will say, Hey, why is that on <laughs> If it's jewelry you're selling, uh, you might put them on there in the Hallmark Channel movie. I don't know, something like that. Whatever women, you women like to watch. Uh, at HGTV or something. So they'll go home and say, oh, yeah, I want that jewelry. But anyway, you, you see the point. <laughs> Businesses have a target audience. They have a scheme. They have a strategy for reaching that audience. What is ours, church? What is ours? What is our audience? Who is our audience? Well, it's the lost. Amen? It's the lost. That's who we are trying to reach. The multitudes of people around us as, as those who are around Jesus who need to know the Lord. What are we doing as a church to reach the multitudes? Already named some great things going on in our church. Lots of new ministries have begun this year, and I'm so thankful and so blessed by them. What else are we doing? Well, we also uh, have our service recordings online. We have them on our website. We have them on Facebook. I checked Monday, and, and the last two weeks' messages have been viewed on Facebook 112 times. The last two uh, music services, the last two weeks, they've been viewed the same number of times, 112 times. They have been viewed. Our services have been on Facebook. Uh, Calvin, and I think Calvin very much is doing our videos online now. When I was doing them, I was storing all of our service recordings on a, a website called Vimeo. And this is the place where you can store them and link them to other websites. I went back and checked our stats on our videos on Vimeo. On video, those videos from our services, do you know how many times they've been viewed since we began putting them on there? 
4,574 times services from Bethel Baptist Church have been viewed. They've been viewed in 50 different countries, and they've been viewed on six of the seven continents. Nobody on Antarctica has watched this yet, but eventually maybe. But six of the seven continents, have, have, have somebody on six of the seven continents have viewed a Bethel Baptist service recording. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? So we are in a digital age making a global impact. And who knows the number of people who might have heard the name Jesus for the first time as they sat down and clicked on one of our service recordings. Who knows who might have been saved by watching our recordings. But that's something that we need to keep doing. Amen? That's something that we may never know how many people have benefited from that until we get to heaven one day. So that's one thing we're doing. But let's think about ourselves for a minute. Think about yourself. Your own personal life. Who can you target? Who has God placed in your life that you can tell about Jesus? Who is in your sphere of influence that needs to know the Lord? You know this person. You may know details about their life. You may know troubles they are having. They may share them with you. You may know some health concerns, family issues, financial issues. They may share things with you because you're a friend of theirs and you know they need the Lord. When a fisherman like Mike goes fishing, they use a particular bait for the type of fish they want to catch. He knows what that species of fish will respond to. Well, if God has put somebody in your life and they're telling you things like, I'm really concerned about my health. Or would you pray for me? I know you're a Christian. Would you pray for my mom? She's been in the hospital. Or, boy, we're really struggling financially. Or, boy, my, our marriage is, is on the rocks. It's just not going well right now. And they're trusting you enough, and you know they need the Lord, then you know uh, that the door's already been opened for you to, to share Jesus with them. If you know someone who needs the Lord, who has health issues, then pray with them about their health. And tell them about people within our own church who've been healed because they believe in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and you know somebody, ladies, who's divorced and lonely and, 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 and just, just feels lost? Invite them to Kay McMurray's Sunday school class. If you know a guy, men, who loves sports and you know he needs the Lord, you know he's not going to come sit through a worship service, invite him to Tony Long's small group that's sports and race car based. What's a better thing to invite him? You want to hear about the Lord there just as much as he is here in a service. Here's the point. No one of us can reach the multitudes alone. But when we all work together, when we're all telling somebody about Jesus, when we're all doing our part, then through the power of Jesus, we can reach a multitude of lost people around us. And while we're talking about this, let me give you permission to do something. Not that you need my permission to do it, but here it is. If you know somebody who may not respond well to coming and sitting in the sanctuary for an hour and listen to music and preach it, you have my permission. Don't invite them to a service. Invite them to a small group. That's fine. Bring them to church somehow. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's commit to do what we know we ought to do and reach the multitudes together. Oh, but Scott, people will come. People just won't come. We've even got church members here at Bethel, and they barely come. What's the use of inviting somebody that doesn't even know the Lord? Well, just to understand this. When we refuse to reach out for Jesus, we are not arguing with the pastor. We are arguing with the master. When you refuse to reach somebody for Jesus, you're not arguing with the pastor. You're arguing with the master. That's actually what we see Simon doing in verse 4 and 5 in our scripture today. He's arguing <coughs> Excuse me, with the master. Verse 4 says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Jesus said to Simon, go out to the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon said, Master, we've toiled all night. We've not caught anything. Why? Really? Jesus, throw out our nets. Don't you, you don't know how long we've been fishing. We've been out all night long. We've caught nothing. Nothing, I tell you. We're exhausted. It would be a waste of time. We just washed our nets. It'd be a waste of time to go back out, throw into the water, and catch nothing again. Jesus asked us, asks us to talk to others about his love, throw in our nets. And we might say things like this, Jesus, I'm too busy. I don't have time for that. Jesus, I'm an introvert. 
I have a hard time talking to people. Jesus, it's a waste of time. People know our church is here. We're open every Sunday morning. If they won't come to church, they'll come. Preacher, we pay you to go out and tell others about Jesus. I shouldn't have to. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Arguing with the master. Let me set you up in this scenario. If you're a Christian, one day you're going to be in heaven. And let's imagine that you are sitting in heaven one day with Jesus. Won't that be awesome? And you're sitting with Jesus, and he shows you something. He shows you a friend of yours at school. Or he shows you a, a, a co-worker of yours. And they're in hell. And he says to you, I put them in your life so that you would tell them about me. Why didn't you? Why didn't you tell them about my love? Will you say to Jesus, oh, I, was, I was too busy. Will you say to Jesus, I have a hard time talking to people. Will you say to Jesus, they knew the church was open, they should have come. Will you say to Jesus, I gave my offerings that prayed the pastor, he should have reached them. I don't think any of us would want to say those things to Jesus. See, there's no excuses for disobeying the command of the Lord. Don't make excuses. Don't argue with the Master. Be obedient to His call on your life. Reach out with His love. Be completely obedient in all that He calls you to do. We say, I surrender all. If you sing it and you meant it, that's what we have to do. We have to surrender all. Complete obedience to Him. And if we read closely in our scripture today, we see that Simon was only partially obedient to Jesus. Let's look back at a verse here again. We see that Simon had incomplete obedience. Number three in your outline, there was incomplete obedience. Look at verses four and five. Read the same ones again. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out to the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've told all night and caught nothing, Nevertheless, it's your word, I'll let down the net, singular. Jesus said, let down your nets, plural. Simon said, sure, I'll let down my net, singular. He only partially obeyed Jesus. And what a difference that S made. What a difference that S made. Jesus knew what was coming. Lots and lots of fish. But Jesus, or Peter didn't understand what Jesus could do. So he put down a single net, perhaps just to appease Jesus. Then we read what happens next in verse 6 and 7. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partner, partners in the other boat, to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats. The boats began to sink. There were so many fish. You see, they weren't prepared for the abundance of blessing that Jesus brings when we obey him. What can Jesus do? He can bring us an abundant amount of blessings when we are obedient to Him. They couldn't hold all the fish they caught in one net. Had they completely been obedient and cast their nets, they would have had this problem. But incomplete obedience left them unprepared. Let me ask you a question, folks. Are we being completely obedient to Jesus as the church? Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that God wants to see empty pews in Bethel Baptist on Sunday morning? I don't. Do you believe that Jesus can fill our nets? Do you believe Jesus can fill the sanctuary to overflowing? I believe it. I believe it. I have seen it with my own eyes. As you know, I've been here six years now. But in the eight years before I came to Bethel, I was a minister of music at Russellville Baptist. And the first year I was there, we began a building program. And we built the Family Life Center that's behind the church now. We knew it was coming. The church was growing like crazy. God was blessing us. And we knew there would come a day when everybody wouldn't fit in the sanctuary. And so at some point while I was there, we said we need two services. So we began having an early service and then a 1030 service. Well, just within this past couple of months, the early service and the second service is not enough room at the Roosevelt Baptist Church. They don't even use their sanctuary right now for worship. They have to meet behind the church in the Family Life Center because they won't all fit in their sanctuary. Why? Because
because God is filling that church overflowing with people. I believe God can do it here, don't you? He did it there, and it used to be. There was empty pews at Roosevelt Baptist on Sunday mornings, but now they don't have enough room to fit everybody. But they were completely obedient to God's word. They prepared themselves. They said, we believe Jesus can send us an abundance of blessings. Let's build this building behind our church. One day we're not going to fit the sanctuary and we'll need to go over there and have worship. And that's what they're doing today. Church, if we have that kind of faith, if we understand and get ourselves ready and prepared for the blessings that Jesus wants to send to us, He's going to send them. Amen? And when we're obedient, He's going to bless us. And church, we better be prepared. Each morning, we ought to prepare ourselves as individuals for the abundance of blessings that God wants to pour out on you during the day. As you get yourself physically ready for school, as you get yourself physically ready for, for work, trying to look your best, we ought to get ourselves spiritually ready for the abundance of blessings that Jesus wants to pour into your life that day. Are we preparing to reap a harvest in our life? Are we praying that God would send people your way during the day that you could share His love with? Let me ask you a question. Are you being strengthened weekly by attending church, one of our services, or the body of believers? Are you doing that each week? Are you coming and being here each week, being strengthened by being in His presence? Well, are you doing this? Are you growing spiritually in your walk with the Lord to prepare yourself for the blessings He wants to bring you by attending a small group on Sunday evenings? We have some awesome small groups at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights. People growing close together in their love for one another. People growing in their walk with the Lord as we learn in those small environments more about His love for us. Let's think about this for a moment. We've got to prepare ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves for abundant blessings. There's a responsibility we have, but when we're preparing ourselves and we're, when we are prepared, we understand number four. It's not anything about us, but it's Jesus that fills our nets. It's Jesus that will fill our nets. Verses six and seven remind us of that. Let me ask you this question. What changed the outcome of, of Simon's nets? They were empty all night long. They didn't catch anything, he said, all night long. And then Jesus said, put your nets down. And there were so many there were sinking the boats. What's, what changed about the situation? Did Simon suddenly become a better fisherman? No. Did he work just a little harder at throwing that net than he did before? No. Did, were the fish, magic fish like mops, and just all of a sudden when he whistled, they jumped into his net this time? No. He didn't call those fish with some kind of special whistle. None of those things made a difference. Jesus made the difference. Jesus made the difference. Jesus filled the nets. Folks, you can work till you are blue in the face. We can sit and we can worry while we averaged 120 last quarter and probably just around 100 this quarter in Sunday school. We can develop programs to bring people to church. We can try to be better people, but none of those will make the difference without Jesus. Amen. Nothing that you and I could do if we leave Jesus out will make any difference. Only Jesus will make the difference in your life and only Jesus can make the difference in our church. If you want to lead somebody to the Lord, give the situation to Jesus and be obedient to what He calls you to say to them. If you want to see the pews of this church filled like I do, then be obedient to what Jesus has called us to do. It's time to cast out the nets. And be fishers of men. Be fishers of men, Bethel Baptist. Invite people to church. Invite people to small group. Tell somebody about how much Jesus loves them. Brag on Jesus to someone. Build a relationship with someone at school, someone at work, that enables you to share the gospel of Jesus with them. Be an obedient Christian. Be a fisher of men. That's what Jesus has called us to do. But many of us, we need to have an attitude adjustment and a reminder of the expectation that Jesus has of us as a Christian. And that's why we see having this assignment in verses 8 and 10 in our scripture. We see the attitude is adjusted and the expectation is expressed. The attitude is adjusted and the expectation is expressed. Look at verse 8 with me. 
after the nets had become so full, and, and, and Peter and Simon Peter had been arguing with Jesus, saying, we've done this all night long, what's, gonna, what's the difference it's going to be this time? When those boats became full, his attitude got adjusted. When Simon Peter saw it, verse 8 says, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. See, when Simon realized the power of Jesus, he understood his sinfulness when compared to the master of the universe, when compared to the holiness of Jesus. He wasn't arguing with the master anymore. He wasn't complaining about being tired from fishing all night. He wasn't making any excuses to why he couldn't tell somebody about Jesus. He simply fell at the feet of Jesus, confessing his sin. His attitude was adjusted. Do we need an attitude adjustment this morning? Then take a look at the glory of Jesus Christ. Think about what he did to save you. Think about how he came and lived a sinless life and died on the cross for your sin. Think about what it took for him to come and make you righteous in the eyes of God and all the blessings he's given you since you became a Christian. When we meditate on Jesus' love for us, we'll be far less likely to give excuses as to why we can't do the simple thing that he's called us to do and tell somebody else about it. Let Jesus adjust your attitude today. Get rid of any self-centered ambition in your life and start living for Jesus. And when you do that, Jesus will express his expectation of us. Verse 10, Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. That's what Jesus has called you and I to do. Follow him and be fishers of men. That's the command. That is Jesus' expectation of you, Christian. Be completely obedient to his command. There's five things I want you to take away from today's message. Number one, we need to work together as the body of Christ to reach the multitudes. And it takes each one of us doing our part. Number two, stop arguing with the master and stop giving excuses as to why you cannot be his witness. Number three, be completely obedient to what he asks of us. Don't be unprepared for the blessings he can bring to church. Number four, let Jesus fill your nets. Trust his power when you don't feel like you have any. You don't. His power. He will fill your nets. Number five, let Jesus adjust your attitude and understand the expectation he has for your life. That's what God told me to share with you today. That we need to be sharing Jesus with others. And he's brought you here on this Sunday morning for a reason. Perhaps there's somebody in your life that's been running through your mind this whole service. Somebody that you work with. Somebody you go to school with. And you know they need Jesus in their life. How would you respond to this message is the question today. Will you tell them about Jesus? When you tell them that Jesus loves them, you don't have to go up and slap them in the head with the Bible. Just say, hey, man, I went to church Sunday. I'd love for you to come with me sometime and hear what Jesus can do for you. He's changed my life. Adults, there's somebody at your work, somebody in your neighborhood, maybe somebody in your family that needs to know Jesus. Would you be obedient to the call on your life? Students, there's somebody you know at school who needs to know Jesus Christ. If they were to die, they'd end up in hell. And none of us want to see any of our friends there. But God's put them in your class, in your club, in your cheerleading, in the group, whatever, wherever it may be. God's put them, you in their life to be a witness for them, for him, a witness to them. You be obedient to what God's called you to do, and you tell them about Jesus. But maybe in the sanctuary this morning, you're sitting here and you're saying, Dad, I don't know Jesus myself. I need Jesus in my life. I need to be saved. I want to make sure I go to heaven one day. If that's you, it's a free gift. You can accept Jesus as your Savior today and be saved. See, he's already done all the work on the cross. He died for our sins. Each one of us have sinned. The Bible says we all have sinned. Even me, I'm a preacher. I say plenty. We've all sinned. 
and the wages of sin is death and hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in heaven. You just have to accept it. I gave all the money in my wallet to the breakfast this morning, but if I could pull out a $20 bill, and I would say, here's a $20 bill. It's free. Who want it? Somebody would up here and get it, wouldn't they? And I'd say, it's yours. And you can have it. You didn't earn it. You just could receive it. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. Here's eternal life. Here's heaven. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. It's yours. Who will come get it? Who will come get it? If you need Jesus today, as Trey comes and leads us in a hymn of invitation, this altar is open. I'm going to be here. I'd love to pray with you so that you can make Jesus the Lord of your life today. If you're here, and you're visiting, or you're here, and you know you need Jesus, don't be afraid to take somebody by the hand. Church members, if there's somebody you're visiting with, take somebody by hand. They'll come pray with you. If you're our guest this morning, and you're sitting there with your friends, and maybe you know somebody around you that needs Jesus, maybe you could be the one. You can walk them up here today and say, you want to go pray? And you can walk them up here to the altar today. And they can know they are in heaven. Because you love them enough to walk with them in this altar so that they might be saved. Wouldn't that be awesome, girls? Yes. Just be obedient. Listen to God speaking to you. And if He leads you to do something like that today, you come. You take somebody by hand and say, let's go pray together. And you'll be obedient to what the whole message was about today. You'll be obedient to be a fisher of men. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your perfect example. Lord, have your way in this time of invitation now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand. You just, you, just, you, you just respond to how God would bless you today. You need to take somebody by hand and come pray with them. You do it now. That's what you say. I'd love to pray with you. Turning back.